Hello, friends and walkers alike. This is Melissa Hutchison, voice of Clementine from The Walking Dead, and I can't wait to meet you at R2V2 Saturday, September 21st. Greetings, programs, and welcome to episode 260 of The Gaming Outsider, a video game podcast with a focus on our incredible community. It's Monday, Labor Day, September 2nd. I'm your host, Scott Clark, and I'm joined, as always, by my fellow co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, Zach Parkerson. What's up, Zach? Wow, it's a bold intro, I gotta say. You like yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it's true, I am a man, a myth, and a legend, so... Yeah, it should. it's like your built-in box quote yeah, you. For, for Zach Parkerson. <laughs> I gotta put it on my tombstone. Yeah. Uh, dude, we are, uh, wow, it is a second, so we are 20, we are 19 days away from R2-V2. Cannot wait. It is so exciting. We are so close. Uh, we ordered the banner today. Uh, and actually, Nate ordered the banner for us, and that should be arriving, I believe, on the the 11th, 11th or 12th, and we're going to be going to set that up at Cataclysm here, and uh, I cannot wait, man. I'm, I'm so excited to see that thing. I can't wait to show it to you. We're going to have pictures for sure. But are you excited? Looks good. It does look good. It's very good. And speaking of excited, I am very excited to uh, share with you some of our sponsors that are helping us put this whole thing together. First off, Dairy House over at 113 East Main Street in Rockton. Awesome ice cream over there. Open World Gaming, which opens this Friday on September 6th. Available at uh, 320 North Alpine Road in Rockford. I'll talk about them shortly here in just a minute. I actually went there this weekend for their closed beta. And then uh, last one for this segment, Jack's Tire Sales and Service. They are locally owned, and you can hit the road for at Jack's for all your tire needs. They're located at 4829 Prairie Hill Road in South Beloit, or you can find them online at jackstire.com. Uh, I got to tell you a little bit about Open World, man, because they had a, like I said, a closed beta this weekend, which I thought was kind of clever. Yeah, you're also, it's, you're, uh, you've been gushing about this place ever since. Yeah, and I, so I had been, I had been in there when they were setting it up, and it didn't have all the finishing touches. And this time, all of the stations were set up. They've got like little pods set up of about six different, like there'll be six PlayStations in one section, six Xboxes in one section, six PCs in one section. And then they got four switches all along the wall. And you just go there. They've got the system set up. You can actually log into your own. Like I logged into my Xbox Live account and was able to play games from my library if I wanted to download them. Uh, and it, it was great. And I know it seems weird. Like, why don't I just sit at home and do what I was doing online with a friend? But there's something about doing this in person that really just feels like a gaming atmosphere. I, I was playing a game with CB who was sitting right next to me. And... Some guys behind us were playing the same game. And I was like, hey, you guys want to join in? So we wound up doing like a a three-on-three match with perfect strangers and just like made friends up friends with them. And it was it was awesome. Meanwhile, there's a smash tournament going on about 20 feet away from us. So every once in a while you just hear the them erupt in in cheers because somebody, you know, defeated somebody and it was it just it was just a great atmosphere, man. I we gotta stop there while you're in town for rtv2 because it's it's great so it's a very very cool place yeah uh also a place like that growing up where you you would go you pay for some time and get out of there they're fun yeah they 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 do like an hourly rate or you can actually buy a a, a whole day pass and just have the entire day which is kind of cool too there's a there's a tiny little one in uh, rockton back in the day was was next to the roscoe middle school this is very specific rock for talk for anyone listening but i (laughs) remember we used to go and there was only like six bean bags or whatever with stations. Well, I'll never forget uh-huh. this guy uh, bought up a bunch of copies of the game Pariah. I don't know if you remember this at all. It was an Xbox first person shooter. And uh-huh. he just he believed it was going to be the next Halo. He was uh, dead wrong, but he sure had those copies. <laughs> I wonder if he still has them. No. It's like, screw this game. Yeah. I mean, it was games. So I'm going to buy them for a nickel. Right. Right. Well, anyway, if you are in the Rockford area, this Friday is their uh, is their grand opening, and they're actually going to be selling hours for much cheaper than they're going to be selling them normally. And uh, there's going to be all kinds of giveaways. I think they're giving away a Xbox One S. They're going to give away some Newegg gift cards, some fancy headphones. 
like every hour they're doing a giveaway for people that show up. So uh, uh, definitely meet us out there. I, and since Gears 5 drops this week, I'm just going to go and I'm going to play Gears 5, hopefully online with you, Zach. And, uh, and, and we'll have some fun for sure. Well, let's go ahead and, uh, oh, got to give a shout out to Jordan Derringer High. He was actually on an episode for Patreon recently. We talked about Horizon Zero Dawn, but he listened to our episode last week where we talked about uh, collectibles and like the statues. And he heard me say that I really wanted the Black Flag one that that, uh, we saw a picture of while we were recording. And he, he messaged me on Facebook and said, hey, I'm getting rid of some stuff and I've got the Black Flag one. If you want it, you can have it. And I've also got the Assassin's Creed 3 one that uh, Zach can have if he wants it. And so I messaged I messaged you, Zach, and what was your response? Do you remember exactly what you said? I think I swore. Uh, you said hell oh, yeah. Hell, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so thank you very much, Jordan. That was very, very generous of you. I took my Assassin's Creed 4, the Black Flag one, to school. It is now sitting on one of my bookshelves. Perfect. Don't know if that's uh, appropriate to have a pirate in a... In a classroom, but I think it looks cool. So Jordan is a beautiful human. Yeah, it was very nice of him, and uh, he did he did really well on the episode too. Some very insightful things he said about Horizon Zero Dawn. So, well, let's go ahead and uh, jump into the week's news. What do you say, Zach? Sure. Why you know why not? All right, I'm going to start off with this story that is not a fun story to talk about. I actually debated putting it on here because. Boy, everybody's really divided on this story, but uh, you're familiar with the game Night in the Woods. One of the developers by the name of Alex Holoka, am I pronouncing that correctly, Zach? I think it's Alec Holoka, but yeah. Alec Holoka, I apologize, I, miss, I spelled it wrong in the format here, but yeah, Alec Holoka. Uh, sadly, it, it appears that he is, he's, he's deceased, and it, signs are pointing to the fact that he committed suicide. Uh, this comes right after he has been accused of several abuse allegations by Zoe Quinn. Uh, and this is really sad news. It's just kind of shaken the industry a little bit this week. Well, it took place this weekend. And uh, a lot of people are talking about it. What's your What's your take on this, Zach? Oh, boy. Well, it was more than just Zoe Quinn. She's just the most prominent one. So there were right. several accusers. I mean, you know, I heard it described online as multifaceted tragedy. I guess that's probably true. Like, th- there were uh, too many tiny details in the stories. They seemed like allegations that uh, the stories were too similar, you know, for it to probably not be true. Yeah, there were sp- very specific details from different people. Yes, of of uh, disgusting habits he had, let's say. Right. Yeah. Right. But, uh, I mean, this sucks for everyone, right? It really does, and uh, it's 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 just it makes me so angry because when, uh, what led him to take this act, I'm assuming, is you know people started blasting him on Twitter after these allegations came out, and and then as soon as that happened and we found out about it, P- the other side started attacking Zoe Quinn. And she just deleted her her Twitter account, and my my thing with all of this is that none of this is our business and i'm not saying that if these allegations are true that it's right i'm not saying that it shouldn't be brought to light and shouldn't be addressed i just feel like twitter is not the place to do it Um, because whether or not they're either side is guilty in uh, either in the accusations or making the accusations either side is going to make up their mind based on how they feel about the situation and that is the responsibility of people in law enforcement and and people that have hired the hired gentlemen like this one um it, it's just crazy to me how split this argument is on twitter if you watch it there there seems to be equal numbers of people that are blaming zoe for his death and people that are applauding his suicide and saying things like, well, you know, hope he suffered. And both sides just make me, make my skin crawl. And I hate that this kind of conversation is seeping into my hobby. Because if video games weren't popular, like they weren't popular back when I was 15, 16 years old, we wouldn't even be having this discussion because we wouldn't have known about it. So 
I, I don't know what else to say. It is it is just an awful, awful situation that is dividing people even further than they were already divided. Yeah. You got anything more to say? No, I mean it's not, you know it's just not an uplifting topic for our uplifting show. But you're right in that it probably needed addressing because it seemed took our hobby by storm. It really did. It really did, and it just it just it just bothers me so much. This is supposed to be an outlet. This is supposed to be an entertainment thing. It's supposed to be fun. And not even these two people associated with this. So many people just seem to try to make ways to make it miserable. And just just be nice. I understand that we're kind of hidden by this wall of anonymity that is the internet, but it's really not that difficult to be nice and be intelligent and disagree but still respect one another's opinions. And that just, that barely happens anymore. And uh, I I just, I just hate seeing him be there. So if you don't have anything more to say, we'll just go ahead and move on. But the last thing I do want to mention, if you were going through a rough time, please, please talk to somebody. I don't care if it's a friend, if it's a family member, hit me up on Twitter DM, on Facebook Messenger, uh, if you know me personally, shoot me a text. I will talk to you before you have any feelings like this. Talk to somebody because uh, it, it's it's not worth it. And there is help out there as well. If you don't even feel like talking to me or any other person that you know, there's a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that number is 800-273-8255, and somebody there will be more than happy to listen to you as well. All right, let's go ahead and move on. On brighter news... Yacht Club's games, Yacht Club Games announced a uh, new game in Shovel Knight in the in the Shovel Knight universe. It's called Shovel Knight Dig. This was made in collaboration with Nitrome, who is the creators of Bomb Chicken. I know that Nate loved Bomb Chicken, and uh, players basically work their way down through levels, much like in games like Spelunky or Steamworld Dig. And apparently, this game's been in development for a year, but it has no release date yet. Now, you were a fan of the Shovel Knight games, yes? I played a little bit of the first one. I keep meaning to play more. I own the whole thing on Switch, so one day I'll get there. But I, I, Does this one trip your trigger at all? No, not 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 even remotely. It's cool that Yacht Club Games is doing something else. It is. When they did this live stream for it, they said, hey, we're announcing a new game. Part of me was a little disappointed that it was more Shovel Knight. Not that I don't love Shovel Knight, but I was kind of hoping to see just something brand new that was was completely unexpected. Agreed. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm. I was gonna say we we saw their take on Mega Man with uh, Shovel Knight, so I kind of want to take their see their take on other genres. Well, not that aren't dig games because that feels too new. Like I want to see their Zelda equivalent. Oh yeah, like a dungeon crawler, like a over the top. Yeah, yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, that would be very cool. Put Shovel Knight so, in it. I don't care. <laughs> a top-down view shovel night. Yeah, that'll work. That, that might, might not be a bad idea. I mean, I'm still all over this. I, I, I love the mechanics of shovel night so much, and and the difficulty just fits perfectly in my wheelhouse for some reason. So, I'm definitely on board for it. I just uh, was kind of hoping for something fresh, but that's okay. I agree. It, and speaking, I don't know. Like, I I feel like it's so new a genre that I just I wouldn't have expected Yacht Club to tackle it. I guess. You mean the the dig series, yeah, right, like the Spelunkies and the Steam World Dig kind of games, right? Yeah, I don't know. I just wasn't expecting Shovel Knight to star in one of those. I mean, he has a shovel. Yeah, no, I understand why he might be perfectly suited for it, Scott. I'm just saying, I didn't, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> we should have seen it coming. Is is kind of my point? Yeah, no, you're right. It was, it was, it was kind of weird that it was a side scrolling platformer where he had a shovel and there wasn't a whole lot of digging going on, except for you know the occasional pile of dirt that turned into money but uh th- this actually makes more sense in terms of the character actually having a shovel so i will be playing it 100 percent. but as far as games that i probably will not be playing uh, we're also getting a remaster of classic games based on the lion king and aladdin uh, they are coming this fall the collection includes the game boy and sega genesis versions of both games as well as the snes version of the lion king it's going to be coming to PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch on October 29th. Now, were you a little young when these games came out, Zach, or, or were these out yet? I don't, I don't remember what they, year that yeah, was. Yeah, they were out. I mean, it was mid-90s probably, right? But I, right. I had the Genesis versions of both. 
and okay did you, did you play them yeah yeah um i know people have a lot of fun memories that lion king game i don't but, <laughs> but i do like the aladdin one i i feel like i have fun memories of line of the first level yeah, of lion there you king go. it's until you have to start platforming on the giraffe heads or whatever that's when the game fell apart for me, it was the hippo tails that you that the 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 hit box to be able to grab onto those hippo tails made no sense whatsoever if you've ever played a platformer, but even that was somewhat manageable. It was when you for me it was when you got to the ostriches. You had to you were riding on the back of an ostrich and had to duck and jump, and it was it was ridiculous. Do you so, think people's rose tinted glasses are about to get shattered with this re release? Possibly. I think a lot of people might not remember how difficult it is. We actually, I played it recently. I think Nate loaned me his copy and I used cheat codes to beat it because there's no way I was going to get through that game without <laughs> without cheat codes. It's just that ridiculous, especially towards the end when you're in the, I'm not going to say volcano, but there was fire for some reason yeah, in, the, in the Sahara. I certainly do not desert. remember. I, I have fonder memories of Aladdin. It was difficult as well. But it just worked very, very well. It was very Prince... Uh, and, uh, I can't remember if it was the SNES or the Genesis version, but one of them was very Prince of Persia-esque. Well, they were they were both the same style of game. And if you ask somebody which is the superior one, I feel like the Genesis fans will say the Genesis one is superior and the Super Nintendo people will say the Super Nintendo version is superior. Yep, it's whatever you played. So... Um, I, I don't remember. I didn't look at them closely enough, but unfortunately we're only going to get the SNES version of The Lion King. But, hey, you'll get the choice with, with Aladdin at least. So, But Aladdin and, is uh, a better movie and a better game. So there you go. Hmm, that's a bold statement. Aladdin's better than than Lion King? Yeah. Yeah, there's no question. I'm not. I'm, I, By it's, a it's, metric that's a, that's a toss-up. <laughs> that's a toss-up for me. But... You know, one thing I, I didn't put on the format we didn't talk about was the uh, the Telltale story from this week. Oh, and I did. You don't want to talk no, about I mean, it. No, it's fine. It's just, I mean, it's um, it's a different company using their name, isn't it? So it's not like it's not the Telltale you know. Right, and that was what I wanted to bring up. Is everybody's all like, "Hey, Telltale's coming back," but in, in reality, it's just a company that that bought them up and are offering, you know, work to some of the former employees. Right, it's kind of like so the, you know the arg- current Atari, right? It's not the Atari of yesteryear, right? And uh, it's got some people up in arms about it. Still, I'd I'd like to see more Wolf Among Us, uh, even if it's not the exact same team. I feel like uh, somebody else could do it justice at least, or I'd I'd be curious to see what that what that's all about. You could just read the comic it's based on, Scott. I could, but then I would actually have to buy them and then take the time to read them. And, uh, Visit your local I, library, I just, Scott. I just don't have the time, man. I, I don't have the time. Any any reading I do is is uh, in audiobook form because then I can be doing something while I'm reading. And unfortunately, comic books don't translate to audiobook very well. No, yeah, so. not really. <laughs> so that's it for the news. We want to say hello to some new patrons over at patreon.com forward slash the GoCast. Rebecca Muck, Matthew Machand, and Tori Melching all signed up for Patreon this week, and they have access to all of our new bonus content, including our August version for uh, for the Retro Outsider, where we have Zelda games, our first volume of Zelda games. We talked about Zelda 1, Zelda 2, and Link to the Past. So you can check that out. Also, our Break the Seal episode for August on Horizon Zero Dawn. I mentioned it earlier with uh, Jordan Derringer High. You can listen to that as well. And then coming up, in the month of September, we are going to be doing a Retro Outsider on educational games. Uh, apparently, CB wants us to go back and play those games, uh, a, a plethora of games that try to teach us how to read and write back when we were kids and uh, try to get some people involved there. So stay tuned for that. And I think in the future, uh, I have to talk to CB about it, but I'm going to try to talk him into doing a Retro Outsider episode on the original Final Fantasy on the NES with a special guest who will uh, be announced at a later time. But I think that was one you guys will will want to check out. So stay tuned for that. Again, if you'd like any of that uh, bonus content, uh, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the GoCast. Thank you to everybody that's contributing to our Patreon. You help us pay for the show. And uh, it really we really do appreciate it. So if you'd like to throw a buck or two in the, in the tip jar for us, head over there and uh, help us out. We're going to go ahead and jump now into our From the Outside In topic. Got 
Got a couple more sponsors to quick uh, thank over here for their help supporting R2V2. First off, Octane Inner Lounge, great restaurant in downtown Rockford over at 124 North Main Street. Really great place, really great staff. Uh, be sure to check them out. And also want to give a shout out to the Rockford Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. They are supporting R2V2 in our efforts to bring this event to Rockford. So thank you very much. Love that my city is supporting us in our endeavors here and do appreciate it. So for this week's From the Outside In Topic, we're answering questions from you, the gaming outsider community. We asked for questions on Facebook, Twitter, and Discord. And like we do every first episode of the month, we're going to do our best to answer them right here. Zach, why don't you kick things off with our Facebook questions? Sure thing. First question is from Sean Coates. What are some consoles that failed in the market but you enjoyed and felt never got a fair shake? I personally don't understand the hatred gamers seem to have for the Wii U. I believe it's a good system with some good tech under the hood, but the mentality of others seems to be that it didn't sell, therefore it sucks. I think the Wii U is a great example. I loved my Wii U. Mm-hmm. Never understood the hatred for it as well. I, it it bummed me out that the, it, it sold so poorly because uh, they had some great games on there. Well, it's easy to hate something when you don't own it or play it, and that had such a small install base that I bet a lot of people didn't have a chance to play it. So it's pretty easy to dismiss it if you don't even have the opportunity to check it out. Yeah, I it, I agree with you. But there were some bangers on that on that console, and even the one that came packed in with the Wii U, that Nintendo Land. Oh, really? It was like those mini mini games. I had a ton of fun playing those games with when we had people over at the house. The little haunted house one where one person would look at the tablet and everybody else would look at the screen. Did you ever play that? No, I think I played a grand total of about one hour of the Wii U. Oh, really? Yeah. So you didn't own one either? No, no. I, I think one came through the GameStop I was working at, maybe. I don't really know how I got a hold of it, but I just remember it, the controller was wildly uncomfortable. It was the only thing I really remember. Didn't bother me too much. Maybe I well, maybe I had small, delicate hands. Or maybe you had more time to get used to it. Maybe that, too. I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's that different from what the Switch is now. I think it was just, I don't know. that. Yeah, well, I don't play the Switch much in handheld mode anyway, so. That's true. Uh, Wonderful 101 was on Wii U. Right. There are, um, like, I have this dream of playing every game Platinum Games ever made, and Wonderful 101 and Star Fox Zeros are these two that elude me. I forgot you haven't played Star Fox Zero. Yeah. It's not uh, Star Fox Adventures. I will I will warn you oh, with a, that. it's not that good? <laughs> it's not that good. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a, basically a remake of Star Fox 64, if you like that game like I did. I worshipped that game when I was a yeah, kid. Yeah, no, I, I love 64. Uh, I also love Adventures, Dinosaur Planet, one of the great games on the GameCube. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about uh, Sean's question, though? Were there any consoles that uh, that didn't do well, that you didn't feel good, got a fair shake? I mean, I feel like it's an obvious answer, but I did love the Dreamcast quite a bit. Well, I feel like everybody loved the Dreamcast. It just didn't sell well. Right, and uh, I don't even remember. I think like an aunt's boyfriend had one in the basement or something. I used to play quite a bit of it, but I I love the Dreamcast. It had, I mean, especially like in hindsight, you can just see that Sega was allowing such a creativity from their studios. Like Sonic Adventure is a wild depar- a departure of the franchise. A Crazy Taxi is a lot of fun. Shenmue, obviously, like no game is really like Shenmue even to this day. Sea Man, remember mm-hmm. Sea Man? That's a weird one. Oh, the fish with the face on it. Yes, the, it had uh, internet connectivity, and it had one of those fantasy star onlines in that console. Like, it was just a console that was ahead of its time and experimental, and dare I say, brave. I would agree with you. If they could just put the uh, the wire on the controller on the right side of the controller, I'd have been a little bit happier. Yeah, that doesn't age well. But look, even the memory card though had that little VMU. You know, it was a little interactive, almost like a Game Boy. Yeah, like a like a Tamagotchi thing that <laughs> yeah, you slid into the controller. That's so cool, man. Like <laughs> you just the the ideas were flowing free during that time at Sega. Jack yeah, Ryan Radio. I would, I, is that where that game birthed? Yeah, the first one. Okay, there you go. I I don't know. I I I'm trying to think of ones that failed. I mean, I know everybody hates on it. I kind of like the Virtual Boy. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. I mean, I know it like feels like it's burning your retinas when you play it, but at the time, that was that blew my mind that I was seeing things in 3D and and you know it was just black and white vector graphics. But oh, you, you know I what? I was kind of impressed with that. Sorry, uh, the Vita, right? Was that failed? That thing bombed big time, man. Compared to like the PSP's 80 million units or whatever. Right. Yeah, the Vita. The Vita's obviously the biggest fault was the memory card pricing because Sony was being 
jerks about the you know gouging the price on their proprietary memory cards. But there are so many there right. are so many cool games and ideas on the uh, Vita. Oh man, just thinking about how much I love that console. Didn't the Vita have the touchpad on the back of it? It did, yeah. And uh, some games really use it well. Uncharted: Golden Abyss use it very well. Kind of like when you climb the ropes or whatever, you would kind of like drag your you fingers could, or yeah. whatever. Well, yeah, that game is especially cool because it really intermixed everything the Vita had to offer very well. Like you fine tune your aiming with the gyroscope, and you could reload by tapping the corner of the screen. So you know it was. I like the Vita, and it has all the you know the PS One library as well. Plus, couldn't you do remote play from your PS Four on a Vita as mm-hmm. well? Yeah, I still. Games still support it because they have to, but yeah, I remember I, I played a surprising amount of Thief on my Vita. Thief 4 or the original Thief? I mean, I guess it would have been Thief 4, but it was just a reboot called Thief. I think it was in 2014. Kind of came and went. Oh, that one. Yeah. Okay. I had that one installed on my, on my console and I've never played it for some reason. But I played it exclusively so. because Rihanna Pratchett had a writing credit on it. Ah, there you that's, go. So that's all it took. Fair enough. All right, next one comes from Nick Brown. He says, anyone miss a certain game mode that got dropped or evolved into something completely different? For me, I miss a create-your-own-team in Madden. Back in the day, I would create a team and fill it with my fantasy football roster, would, would make the other teams in the league, and then have some fun with my weekly matchup. This mode evolved into a moneymaker now known as Ultimate Team. I don't have the knowledge or the time to make a good MUT team, and I miss the simplicity of create-your-own-team. Uh, I, I I have to assume you're not a big Madden guy, Zach, so you can't relate to this, but do you have any game modes that you miss from yesteryear? I think the only one I can... I mean, it, it feels very specific, but I wish more games had the kind of challenge mode that the Arkham games have. Where like you choose out you mean like the, the combat and predator trials challenges that you could do after the game. Okay. I mean, I feel like um, even Arkham Knight did it where it was like you had to find them in the open world or whatever. You had to do that in Spider-Man 2. Uh, but I really like just going from the list and then just getting the three stars and everything. And, like, it's a really satisfying loop for me. That's why I've been replaying Arkham City for all these, like, past few weeks. Gotcha. It's a lot of fun. I don't know. For me, I kind of miss the simplicity of first-person shooters, like the like multiplayer ones like GoldenEye where there was no progression, there was no, um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you call it in Call of Duty? Kill streaks? Right. Where, you know, where it was just skill against skill. I mean, we still got that in Gears in some respect. Uh, we don't really know what, what's happening with Gears 5 and their multiplayer, but that was a big draw for you and me for the original Gears was everybody was in the same playing field. The maps were identical, just mirrored, and nobody had any advantage. It was a race to get the best weapon, and we don't get that anymore. Everything is always about progression and getting prestige level. And and, and uh, you have an advantage if you've played for 90 hours in the first weekend. You know what I mean? Right. No, I agree with you completely. I wish I kind of wish Gears 5 had some of that still. Because I feel like, yeah, was it Gears 3 had the progression system that didn't really do anything? Like, that was, yeah, it was just bragging rights. Yeah, like... Yeah, I don't need to see a number tick up to make me keep wanting to play multiplayer. Right. I will play the multiplayer and if I, it is fun. I will too, especially if you get with the right group of people, man. That was we talk about that every week, I feel like, but just some good memories that we're gonna relive now with Gears Five coming out. But I'm I'm a little nervous about what they're doing because that's what we love so much about Gears. And I just don't want them to make it complicated. I, I just want a good Gears game that feels awesome. Maybe has some tweaks with some new weapons and good, but I want the balancing to be good, and I want. I, I just I just want to play with my buds, yeah, again, and not feel like I'm on the losing end before the round even starts. Couldn't agree more. All right, you're up. Sure thing. Uh, Si Munoz asks if you could create a Horizon Zero Dawn enemy, what would each of you make? That's an interesting question coming off of our Horizon Zero Dawn talk. I think I would make the tiny little, uh, I don't know what, what the actual name is, but they called them compies in, in Jurassic Park. The little, so like the the little tiny spinning little, ones? No, not the spinning ones, even smaller than that. They were, I think they were introduced in the second Jurassic Park movie, um, The because it, it was the one that attacked the little girl at the beginning of the movie. Oh, okay, yeah, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah, they're not dangerous on their own, they're they're dangerous in swarms because they just you know they, they swarm, 
And uh, that would be kind of cool to see just little robotic versions of compies. And because they would be tough to take out with a bow and arrow, you know, you don't, you don't have a shotgun in, in Horizon Zero Dawn. So this, the, it feels like it runs the risk of being like the flood from Halo though. And that was nobody's favorite. It wasn't, but, uh, you know, upgrades, man. Yeah. There's gotta be, there were some upgrades. Yeah, I'm not trying to put down your choice. I'm just trying to think about it in a gameplay facet. That's true. The flood did drastically change the original Halo. Yes, it really did. It was a big turning point. I think for me, mm-hmm. I would um, it would it would probably be an enemy you wouldn't even fight. It would just kind of be a giant kraken you can see, and the distance is kind of this like foreboding presence. That like why you can't because nobody there. This may get a reason why you can't go out to sea in the game. Oh, that's interesting. Just kind of so this, like just the unknown. Yeah, it's just kind of this thing that exists that people know about. Maybe you can see it, you know, at some point in the story. But I think it would just be kind of a cool part of the lore. That's a really good idea. I kind of like it when games do that. I, I know that m- more recently games like Fortnite are doing that where they just put things in the environment that are somehow lore related, but they don't really explain it and it just gets everybody's curiosity peaked. Right. Like I, I, I don't, I know you don't play it or you play it as much as I do anyway. Remember when they put that, like the giant crack in the, in the sky of the world and everyone's like, do you see that crack? What's the crack mean? And then, and then as the weeks went by, the crack kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That kind of stuff is fun. Yeah, that's really cool. Got to give it to Fortnite for that. Yeah. I do, and I don't hate it nearly as much as many as a lot of people do. Oh, I got to tell you, I had a Comcast guy at my house this week to fix my internet, mm-hmm. and uh, as I do, I'm, I ask him if he's a gamer and try to talk to him about R2V2, and he is a gamer. I'm like, oh yeah, what do you play? And he kind of looked at me sheepishly and said, Fortnite. Because he's like, I know it's kind of, I, I, I'm ashamed of myself or whatever. I'm like, why are you ashamed of yourself? If you enjoy the game, enjoy the game. And it was it's just it's it's like we're looked down on if you like that game because the kids play it as well. I don't I don't understand it, but anyway. Nate Lucas asks, What are your thoughts on digital only consoles? I feel like we <laughs> we don't even need to answer this when you guys already know our answer right. is. Zach, what's yours? Uh you know, in the inimitable words of J. Jonah Jameson, crap, crap, mega crap. <laughs> Not. It's it's gonna it's gonna happen, man. That's what you keep saying, but I, you know, books and uh, comics they're holding on. DVD and Blu-ray still exist. I think I think you still need your disc reader for as long as you can. All right. Maybe you do a cheaper version you. without the disc drive, but I think you always need that option for people. Yeah, I can't tell you the last time I bought a physical game. It's been all digital I can. all day. La- last Friday. We're going to talk about that here shortly, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, if it's Nate, if you're, uh, I'm talking to Nate. I'm obviously pro digital consoles because it just it, I don't I don't need the clutter anymore. I'm get I'm getting to the age where I don't need the I, I don't want to have to resell the games. I just want to get it on my console and not worry about it anymore. But old man, I feel like I might be in the minority. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm definitely getting there. <laughs> Uh, All right, you're up. Sure. Logan Honigford asks, if you play Dragon Quest Builders, what did you think about the game? I don't. Did either of us play this? We did not. However, I will say that Patrick Klein from the EXB cast uh, was a guest on our show, and he played it, and he absolutely loved the game. I think he finished it recently. And uh, so if you were interested in hearing somebody that's not either Zach or I talk about it, uh, check out the EXP cast. Uh, just be careful, Logan. I know that uh, I know you're Kevin's kid and you're a little bit younger. So, Kevin, if you're listening, uh, EXP cast, great guys, love their show, but they are a little bit more PG-13 slash R-rated than we definitely are. Definitely R-rated, so. Scott. Don't sugarcoat it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're they're definitely R-rated. They might be so. AO. A, a couple episodes, yes. Yeah. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. So, Sun Goku asks, is pizza an open-faced sandwich? It's a, ridi- it's a ridiculous <laughs> question. And David Newman followed up with, better question, is a hot dog a sandwich? Okay, so the pi- pizza is a no-go. That's a, non- that's a non-starter for me. That's not a conversation. Pizza's pizza. And pizza covers such a wide gamut of things that it needs to be its own category. It can't be a sandwich. The world cannot handle that. The hot dog thing... Well, what if you took a, what if you took a pizza and folded the entire thing in half... That's a calzone. ...and then ate it... Yeah. Or it's a pizza taco. Yeah. I, would, I, just, I can't live in a world <laughs> where a pizza is also a sandwich. There's... No, when I hear sandwich, I think bread, and I understand that crust is technically a bread, yeah. but I don't think of crust as bread right. for sandwich. I feel reason. like sandwich has soft. I mean, I guess you could press a sandwich on a panini press or whatever, but you need, yeah, you need bread, bread. 
Not dough bread. Not crust. You need bread. I, th- I think the dough and the bread comparison is the biggest differentiator for me between being pizza or a sandwich. Because, I mean, you can have marinara sauce on the sandwich. Yeah. Right? Like chicken parmesan sandwich. You can have mozzarella killer. cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Heck, I'll eat a pizza sandwich from Potbelly's. Oh, yeah. I get to, they used to have, I know you hate Subway, but I used to get pizza subs from Subway all the time. Yeah. Which is just, you know, pepperoni and I don't know, whatever other meats they did. And they'd put mozzarella cheese and black olives and nuke it in the microwave and it was all good. Yeah. But I can, I can understand, but I do not respect the argument for a hot dog being a sandwich. See, we're going back to our argument because a bun is definitely bread, no, right? No, absolutely. That's why I said I can understand what you're trying to get at. I, refu- I, I refuse to call a hot dog a sandwich on principle. Yeah, for me, bread – well, if, here's, the th- here's the thing is a hot dog bun is still connected, right? Yeah. The, the ends of the bun are still connected. Uh-huh. So in order for it to be a sandwich, it has to be two separate independent pieces of bread. I just – so. Uh... I don't know if that's true because it would be like a hoagie. Sometimes you get a hoagie roll that's intact on the side. Right. That's right. a sandwich. I've made sandwiches on a hot dog bun in a pinch. But uh, yeah, I just I can't I can't come around to this idea of calling a hot dog a sandwich. Can I get a hot dog sandwich? It doesn't sound right. You don't ask for a burger sandwich. It's a burger. Although they do make tube shaped burgers that you can get and put in a hot dog bun, which is weird. But I know. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm arguing anymore. against myself. I know, right? You can, I, I guess the connection thing doesn't make sense either because you could just connect the hot dog buns too, right? And then the, that doesn't magically turn it into a sandwich. Right. We are going way deeper into this than I ever thought we were going to. <laughs> so, but but keeping on with the food, you got another one, man. Oh, yeah. GamerDad03 asks, would you guys kill someone to get a Popeye's chicken sandwich? <laughs> What is up with Popeye's chicken sandwiches all the time? I mean, at this point, I kind of would kill somebody. The curiosity is overwhelming. Is, do they have a new sandwich? Is that the deal? They, well, they yeah, they introduced a chicken sandwich, you know, a little bit of a Chick-fil-A competitor. People seem to love it quite a bit. They sold out months early. It's a big deal. I did want to try the spicy version, but it's just not worth going through the hassle to get one. I, I think I've been to Popeye's chicken once in my entire life. Well, they rolled out a sandwich in mid-August, and a bunch of food critics said it was the best chicken sandwich in fast food. And then people tried it, and then some some bigger website did like a poll, and Popeye's won over Chick Fil A for best sandwich. And it's just it's a lot of drama out there in the chicken sandwich game. That's very strange, but you know Popeye's is open on Sunday, so it kind of wins. Yep, yep. There was some Popeyes that put up a sign that's like a hey, chicken sandwich you can get on Sunday. <laughs> no, did they yeah. really? <laughs> Which is all clever right, marketing, right. if you ask me. Ah, eh, good call. Next one comes from Drew Ross, and he wants to know what your top three favorite movies of all time are. Well, at least he asked a softball question. <laughs> yeah. What's yours? Uh, the Matrix is number one. Yeah, I knew that. Uh, the, you know, the 2002 Spider-Man's definitely on there. Mm-hmm. Maybe, uh, man, The Dark Knight or Mad Max Fury Road could be number Ooh. three. So you got uh, either a, a tie for third or one of them being an honorable mention? Yeah, I guess it would be like a tie. I mean, I'd probably like The Dark Knight more just because of Heath Ledger's Joker. But boy, that Fury Road's pretty good. That was pretty good. I actually have that one on iTunes or something, and I have I keep meaning to go back and watch it on my on my uh, 4K TV, and even though it's not going to be in full 4K, but it would be upscale. I just watched it a few weeks ago, and it holds up. It is a perfect yeah, movie. S- I haven't seen it since the theater. I think my favorite part of that movie is the, the, the shot of one of the guys on the on the vehicles that's like playing guitar. Yeah, mm-hmm. like kind of leading the charge. He keeps coming. He back. just totally looks like he he just totally looks like a character from Guitar Hero. He does. <laughs> it's like a, it looks like a video from like the opening scene to a Guitar Hero game, and it's awesome. It's pretty rad. There's just so much it's slick storytelling. It doesn't waste your time. That movie, Fury Road. Which, I agree. Which I respect. It just keeps going and going and going. Yeah. What a good. You're making me want to go back and rewatch it's it. It's pretty good. It's the only movie I've seen five times in the theater. I can tell you that. Holy cow. I, yeah, that movie's great, man. I think the only movie I've seen that many times in the theater was uh, Force Awakens. I mean, it's not a bad movie. Yeah. Uh, for me, I have weird choices. Um, 
I st- I just absolutely adore Fight Club. Yeah, great movie. I love great that movie. movie. Yeah. Uh, and it just that is one of the only movies that's legitimately surprised me at the end and just made me think so much. Uh, I would also probably put Inception in there somewhere because I've rarely do I walk out of the theater just like pondering possibilities. And you know a movie has really hit me home, hit home for me, if it has an ambiguous ending and I liked it because I normally despise ambiguous endings. And that one has an ambiguous ending and I loved it. I was walking out of the theater chatting about that movie for hours with my friends about what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, was he in a dream? Was it, did the top drop? And it just, <laughs> you know, I, I love that. Um, third would probably be Dead Poet Society. There's not Back to the Future on this list? No, I love Back to the Future, but, uh, this, this movie inspired me to want to be a teacher and uh, very, very – hold a special place in my heart, and I just absolutely loved it. I used to quote it when I was a kid. Carpe diem was my, my, my jam. I used to – you know, when I'd sign my yearbooks and stuff, I'd put carpe diem at the bottom of it and stuff. I just thought it was you know, like seize the day. Yeah. Live life to the fullest right now because, you know, we're going to all be dead someday. And it's not going to all be for naught unless you leave a legacy kind of thing. So uh, those would be my three favorite movies probably. We both have a Nolan film. Good point. Yeah. Man, Dark Knight would be up there for me. Man. That 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 is one of the few movies that I legitimately just love to go back and rewatch. Yeah, it, it uh, never gets old. It really doesn't. Yeah, it, that and The Departed never gets old for me either. Yeah. I, I have been informed that there is no movie I quote more than The Dark Knight. I, I would believe yeah, you. Just walk around the house, do Joker quotes. It's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make this pencil disappear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's all part of the plan, is what I say a lot. <laughs> anyway, Low Sugar Attack asks, not sure if this has been asked before, but do any of you have any thoughts on PSVR? I think, I'm thinking about getting it and would love to hear some opinions. I will tell you, PSVR is a quality setup for, for VR for its price. And I don't mean to say that negatively about PSVR. I've had a lot of fun with that. But after playing things like uh, the Oculus Quest and uh, the Vive, I, I that hardware is much, much better, but it's going to cost you a lot more. So as long as you were, you were okay uh, going that route, I would recommend the PSVR surely. I mean, Beat Saber plays great on it. Moss is awesome. Astrobot Rescue Mission is a must play if you've got PSVR, so you 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 can't go wrong. Um, just uh, just know that it's not going to be as good as it gets. It can get better. I will weigh in a little bit differently in that I enjoy PSVR, but it is it is not something that I feel is necessary. You know, if you're if you're questioning like spending several hundred dollars to get in, I don't think you're missing out on like several hundred dollars worth of entertainment. Oh, okay. Like it's just, I think it's, I think it's like a neat novelty, but I haven't really played the game that's truly blew me away yet. And I've played Astrobot, and I've played uh, some of, um, I played, I only played the demo for Super Hot VR, but that was pretty cool. So maybe that's the one. Did you play Blood and Truth? Yeah, I played their first one. That was on the VR thing, and it's really cool. You get, you do get enraptured in the story, but it's still for me. Uh, I still, I still feel myself getting more immersed in games with a, like the standard setup. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I guess that's fair. Even even, what is the PSVR two? I know I, now it was like two hundred bucks on sale like last fall or something. Yeah, for but, Black Friday, that's when I picked it up. Right. I, I don't know what the price is now. I'm, I'm I would guess it's about three hundred bucks. Yeah. So you you make a valid point. Is it is it worth a? You know, you're you're looking at a handful of games and and it costing you three four hundred bucks. There, there's an argument to be said there, and and I feel like there's not a ton of PSVR titles still coming out. Uh, but that's that's going to happen when we're on the precipice of of a console generation, right? Yeah, and you know, I I assume VR will get there and be really cool. It's just, I mean, I really like third person games. Those are kind of hard to pull off on VR. Yeah. All right, Michael Machan says, "What is your opinion on the Switch tax that seemingly inflated prices of games on the Switch just because they are on the Switch? It seems like Nintendo is uh, charging premium just to be on their platform." Boy, to answer your question, because they can, I mean, it's uh, it's all about business, right? And if people will pay for it, it's worth it to them. So why not 
charge that price on it. And it seems that, is it fresh? You know what we learned when the LA Noir remaster came out and stuff, and it was ten dollars more. Is it's just a reality of the cartridge. You know, not a, not as many places print cartridges. It's just more expensive to get those switch cartridges out there. And mm-hmm. you better believe 2K ain't going to eat the cost if they don't have to. They'll pass that right along to you. Absolutely. What what boggles my mind is how some of the digital games on the Switch are more expensive than the physical copies. I was talking to uh, Jake at Open World Game this weekend, and he was talking about how they were buying copies of uh, Smash Brothers for their for their shop. And they wanted to get it digitally just so they could have it installed right on the on the console so they don't have to worry about swapping out cartridges. And he said that the physical versions were on sale for $39.99 through a, uh, some, some special through, uh, I don't know if it was Best Buy or Amazon or something. But the if you were to go to the eShop, it's still the full $59.99. Does not make any sense to me how a physical copy is, is cheaper than a, than a digital copy at all. But that's, that's the market, I guess. So, but yeah, you make a good point there, Zach, in terms of, uh, you know, cartridges are a little bit more expensive to manufacture than, uh, than, than discs, yeah, right? It's just an unfortunate reality of the market, you know? Yeah. Yep. And, I agree. and you're right. If people wouldn't pay for them, they would figure it out. But people seem more than happy to buy games on the Switch and buy them again, even if they already own them, because they want it on the Switch. Well, it's it's just a a fact of Nintendo fans in general. If it's on Nintendo, people are willing to do it. Uh, I mean, mean, look at all Nintendo has to do is drop different colors of their consoles or Joy Cons, and they will sell. There is. It's just the nature of Nintendo fans. There are few fan bases quite as rabid as the Nintendo diehards. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. I don't think it's a bad thing if you're a fan of it. If that's what you're into, yeah, that's fine. Might say, yeah, exactly, absolutely. And then uh, Stoyan Jovic. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's right. If you could make anyone for the podcast a character in a video game, this includes Christy, what would you make them into? Boy, that is a loaded question. Isn't it just, just look at our banner on our website? <laughs> That's a good right? question. That's a good point. <laughs> just look at our banner. Yeah. Uh, you know. that, uh, well, I mean, that... Christina is Zelda, your Link. I'm Spider-Man flipping about. Is it Bob? Is Isaac Clark? Is that right? Yep. Owens is uh, mm-hmm. Mega Man. Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, CB is the Lone Wanderer from Fallout. Okay, yeah. And Chad is Chrono from Chrono Trigger. Yeah. But but I think Stoyan's question is, who would we pick for each other? Like, if I could turn you into a video game character, what would it be? If you could turn me into a video game character, what would it be? Not just, like, what is my favorite game. Right. Like, who do I? Who in video games do I think you are? Yeah, that, that's, that's probably a good way to say it. <laughs> rookie rookie cop Leon Scott Kennedy. <laughs> comes to mind you picture me as Leon Kennedy I have to grow my hair yeah, a little, he, little he, bit in the front he rock the boy band hair and then his middle name is Scott so he's already halfway there right. yeah I don't know so right. Lee, I don't know why that's the first uh, first character that popped in the head though so that's who you are he does kind of look like what's his name from the Backstreet Boys doesn't he Lance I never Bass, thought about yeah. that until just now no not Lance no. Bass that's insane oh, is it really sad that I know my boy band yeah, you, right sorry I didn't mean to offend your boy band sensibilities <laughs> Uh no, Carter. Carter. What was his name? The Backstreet Boys. Oh, boy. Nick Carter. Nick Carter. Doesn't he? Yeah. Look kind of like Nick Carter. Absolutely. Yes. Boy, I I just really don't know. I because I, I feel like any any character I pick is going to somehow be taken offensively. That's fine. You can offend <laughs> you know me. I mean? That's yeah. Uh, I just I mean your 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 personality is you've got a very dry sense of humor, so you know and and. Uh, like you're not you're not you're not upbeat, so I, I can't pick somebody that's just like over you know like very bubbly or anything like that. I've got to pick somebody that's a little bit darker, and um, I just can't think of a character that is that that's that's just not like an on the nose kind of dark character. You know what I mean? Like like maybe maybe Alucard. How about that? Okay. Even though you hate the game, yeah, he's very pretty. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. See, Leon Kennedy, he's in over his head, but he doesn't let that get him down. Just like when you're setting up all this R two V two stuff, you you persevered <laughs> right. and you managed to survive what it seems to be as stressful as a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> well, thanks, man. There you go. Appreciate it. Uh, are we are we gonna really go through the entire seven, the entire eight man team now on on this or? Well, I mean, I feel like Owens can only be Mega Man. Just when I think of that guy, I think of Mega Man. 
Yeah, I just I, I either that or a, or a somebody like Joe like John Madden. Yeah, <laughs> here's a Chad guy. is a Rocket League driver. There you There's go. No question. There you go. Uh, Christina can be two B. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That'll make her happy. She should, she should appreciate that. <laughs> uh, we got Bob. He's the, he's the, he is the announcer on Madden. Oh, there you yeah. go. And then CB Pat Summerall. Man, CB could. He could be anything. It's hard to nail him down. <laughs> he's just, it, w- w- what's like the most foul mouth character you can think of in video games? And that would be CB. He's a he's the guy piloting the ship in that uh, finger game. Oh, the <laughs> freedom finger. Freedom finger, yeah. There you go. Or he is the freedom finger itself, however that works out. I I like it. I like it. All right. Uh, I forgot to put the name of this person on here, and I feel horrible. But uh, somebody asked, if your life was the board game of life, where would you be on the board? I want to say this is Gamer Dad again, but I could be wrong. I would have flipped the board game over and left the room. So (laughs) that's my my answer. (laughs) I mean, because let's see, the the game of life you start like in college, right? And then you get a and then you get a job and you work your way through. I haven't played. I don't remember much of that until you hit the retirement. I know I'm not at retirement for sure, but where? Well, first of all, I don't know enough about the game of life, but I'm just telling you, if I could take a lighter to the corner of the board while no one is looking, I might have done that too. Oh, you didn't like the game? I don't like life. I'm not talking about life in general. I'm talking about do you like board? Like where would you yourself be on this board of life? And I'm telling you, I would. Oh, okay. I would not be playing the game. I'd be grumpily sitting in the other room. (laughs) Fair enough. I get your point now. Uh, I would be uh, in the stock market investing money. Probably that was the thing that I could not wrap my head around when I was a kid. But now that I'm an adult and actually, you know, preparing for retirement, looking to make some money, I get that a little bit now. Yeah. So. Even though it didn't, that's not how the market works. When that game, that game was basically like a one in ten chance to, to like gamble your money away and either come out ahead or lose all of it. It was it was basically gambling. I guess to some degree, investing is somewhat like gambling. Yeah, to, to a degree, right? Right. Yeah, I guess so. If it doesn't work out, it sure is. It, well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that was Gamer Dad that did ask that question. I just double checked okay. and looked it up, so he was able to sneak in two questions in there. He always does that guy. But Aqua yeah. Silent asks, has anyone seen the Dying Light 2 trailers or gameplay? I feel like it's a lot more improved than the first ones from the very little I played, but it's improved the amount of parkour and its graphics look amazing from what I've seen. Well, Scott and I saw that game first day of E3, and it looks great. It looks fantastic. If you'd like to hear us talk more about that, go back and listen to our E3 episodes. You can find them on our website, thegamingoutsider.com. That was one of the most impressive games we we saw at the show i believe I, it was it was at the top of the list wasn't it yeah i mean somewhere right, i haven't yeah. heard anything about that game since what well, does it come out until next year i know we just feel like we we we'd be hearing something or some changes that they've made or or some new gameplay videos or something but even what we saw is are those trailers out there yet yeah like what I we saw so. yeah i'm pretty sure it's just about you know choice making and parkour and stuff Right. So, I mean, the game looks really cool, and it seems like My, they're willing to make a lot of you know parts of the games that not everyone will see, which is always really cool. One of my favorite things about uh, that demo for Dying Light 2 was that it was a live demo. It wasn't just a recording of something. They actually had one guy narrating the other guy playing the game live in front of us, which is kind of cool. And we knew it was legit because he, didn't he like mess up? Yeah. In, yeah, in the one guy made, the, like the narrator made fun of him. Yeah, yeah, he, dr- he missed like a the, kick. He, that's what it was. Yeah, he missed a kick, and you know, he's getting teased by the announcer guy. So that was that was kind of funny. I also remember we had to we had to give up those statues because there was no way we were going to get those things home. Yeah, How, I would say it worked out. Would you say those were like two feet tall? Two feet? That seems a bit drastic. It looked like a twelve-inch statue, though. Um, well, I mean, the box was at least yeah, at least eighteen. The box inches. was massive. Yeah, it was it was kind of crazy, but. Uh, we found a good we found good homes for them. Yes, absolutely. So that was that was awesome. Anyway, the last question comes from Jordan Derringer High, and he says, "If you lived in the last video game you played, would you be happy? Also, if it's a game with multiple places, towns, continents, worlds, etc., what place in the game would you choose to live, and why? What's the last game you played, Zach? The very last game I played would be Control. 
and are you mopping up side missions and stuff and yeah i'd be pretty happy being in the oldest house i understand there's some danger in there but that's what makes it exciting there's so much to learn okay last game i i was in we're going to talk about shortly which is the uh dark age anthology man of medan uh i would not be happy <laughs> because uh you know an abandoned world war ii vessel floating in the middle of nowhere uh, filled with creepy things does not sound like a great place to be. And plus there's no Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, oh, so yeah. So <laughs> definitely not no game, No game consoles in there? Who cares? Yeah. Uh, although, you know, at the beginning of the game, you're, you are on a, on a boat doing some underwater scuba diving. I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind doing that as long as the creepy stuff that happens later doesn't happen. So I guess that's it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you to everybody for all those questions on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Discord. We'll have a topic up for you next week as well, so stay tuned for that. I think we're going to be talking about uh, which, what, like, what games we remember finishing first. Like, what's the first game that you remember actually completing, whether it be as a kid or if you started gaming uh, as an adult? What's that very first experience you had, and was it a positive one or was it a negative one? So stay tuned to Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Discord for that question to be posted later this week, and we'd love to hear your responses there. Speaking of Facebook, we do have some members to say hello to. Uh, you can find our group over at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the GoCast, and we've got Tyler Eichholt. Mia Stagold and Jacob Gunderson all joined the Facebook group this week. Thank you so much for that. Hope you're enjoying the community. Also, we've got an iTunes review that came, that comes from the one and only Tori Melching. She actually hunted me down on Twitter and said, hey, I got a review for you and took a screenshot of it and showed it to me to make sure that I got it. So this one's for you, Tori. She says, very good podcast. This is the podcast for you if you are a gamer. These guys and gals talk about not just the big titles, but the indie as well. Their vast knowledge of gaming never ceases to amaze me. They're funny, insightful. Also, claptrap rules. I have a feeling that one... That was for you. Yeah, it feels like a pretty direct shot at me. Um, She's dead wrong, obviously, because he's one of the worst characters ever, but whatever. She's not wrong. I like Claptrap. I like Claptrap. Man, that game comes out soon. Holy cow, there's just like so many games coming out right now. Speaking of the website, we've also got my review of Super Cane Magic Zero is available up there at thegamingoutsider.com. And I've also got an editorial I wrote on open world gaming that I mentioned just a second ago. With that, we're going to go ahead and jump into the games we've actually been playing. All right, before I hand the reins out to Zach, i got to say thank you to a few more sponsors for the Rock River Valley Video Game Convention. First off, The Hollywood Outsider, fantastic podcast, and my old show. Uh, the, you can find their show at the same place you listen to this podcast, or you can go to their website, thehollywoodoutsider.com. Also, Goodwill Northern of Northern Illinois is uh, pitched in to help us out. And Disc Replay of Rockford, which can be found at 6085 East State Street in Rockford. And they've also got a website at discreplay.com forward slash Rockford. And uh, also, In Tandem Financial, uh, financial advisor Chad DeMar, his actual official title is Financial Services Professional. He is a fantastic guy to talk to if you want to get your finances in order. His website is intandemfinancial.com. And then lastly, Notebook Entertainment, uh, Wyatt Elliott and Chris Williamson are both filmmakers here in the Rockford area. They've got a couple series called The Dedersons and the F My Life short film series. You're going to want to check that out at notebookmovies.com. Zach, we have quite a list of games to talk about this week that's coming out. We'll lay it on us. Well, first up is the cheating simulator Catherine Full Body coming on PS4 September 3rd. That that trailer is ins- How are they going to throw a third person into that? It doesn't even make any sense you to me. You know what? Uh, some, I was reading some early reviews of it out of Polygon and stuff, and it sounds like it works pretty seamlessly. Okay. That's what, I, that's what I'm reading. It seems impossible to me because it's such a dichotomy that's happening in the game's narrative, you know? It does, and I'm I'm curious, but not curious curious enough to probably play through it again, just because there's too many other good things coming out in September, yeah, the, and it's only on PS. The real shame is that I do want to play it again, but I, the introduction of the third character makes me want to play it less. Actually, really, why is that? Because I just I feel like the first game story was really well done, and it really did boil down to you know chaos and order represented by the wife and the girlfriend, and you know basically cheating. It just feels like adding a third 
character that makes really messes up stuff and it scares me more than it intrigues me that that character is there hmm. her name is okay, Catherine with a Q by the way what Catherine with a Q Catherine yes I guess so well, there's no U though so it's just Catherine oh my yeah, god I think she goes by Rin though for the sake of ease anyway yeah. uh, root letter last answer comes the PS4 PC and Switch on September 3rd this is a visual novel that's a follow up to the first root letter that I played 15 to 20 minutes of and got bored with. Oh. So. Well, that's a great selling point. Well, first, it was kind of a cool murder mystery. It's just, I don't think visual novels are for me, even though I keep trying. Fair okay. enough. Children of Morta coming on PC September 3rd, and then it'll come out on PS4 and Switch in October 15th. This game looks kind of neat. I think that game looks, yeah, I think that looks really yeah, good. Yeah, you seem pretty excited about this one. Well, it, it 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 feels a little bit like Moonlighter in the look, and yeah. if you remember how much I loved Moonlighter, you did love Moonlighter. I sure did. I sure did. When well, we got Last Oasis coming into PC early access September third, this game looks a lot like Ark, you know that kind of game, Rust or whatever. Yeah, this is an MMO, isn't it? Well, yeah, it looks like a, a shared world kind of thing, but you're basically be building resources to do build these giant land ships that are very steampunk in nature and these these long spindly almost spider legs that carry you around on the ship seems kind of it's neat. An interesting world just not like a game I'm in, I'm real interested in playing not knocking it just not for if me if it was a like single player adventure in this world I'd probably be intrigued but it's just yeah the the genre doesn't do it for me but then we got that river city follow up with river city girls coming to PC PS4 and switch on the 5th that seems like a game you might be interested in Scott yeah, and did you ever play River City Ransom back on the NES? I played Scott Pilgrim versus the World, which I hear is pretty much the same thing. Oh, it's very similar, yeah. very similar. Yes, um, it was obviously a lower graphical quality back in the eight bit sure. eight bit era, but uh, this is apparently you were playing as the girlfriend of one of the characters from the original game. It's a beat 'em up, and those games are are often very fun. So I might check it out. Yeah, sounds pretty cool. We got Headliner Novi News coming to Switch on the fifth. I couldn't. A little adventure game. Yeah, where you are you are playing a member of the press, and you have to decide which articles get approved for print, and and you get to watch the effects of how that affects society. I thought that was a really clever concept. Yeah, I mean, it looked it looked neat. Uh, yeah, Green Hell coming to PC on the fifth. Has, has, it's another Survivor game yeah, on the Amazon. I kind of feel I feel like I've seen advertisers for this ever. Is it like leaving early access? Maybe. I think so. I've been seeing it a lot on uh, my PR hub. They've been advertising it for several months. Right. I actually yeah. am surprised it's it's only getting released now. I, I In my mind, this game was already out for some yeah, reason. Yeah, the, the marketing has felt relentless on this game forever. But mm-hmm. then you have Hypaforma coming out on the Switch on the 5th. This game looks interesting. I, I, I love me some puzzle games, and this looks very um, bright and colorful and, and uh, psychedelic in a fun way. Yeah, I mean... It doesn't. It didn't do much for me, I guess. But uh, Monster Hunter World Iceborne coming out of PS4 and Xbox One on the sixth. That's sure to trip a lot of triggers out there. Yes, just not mine. <laughs> exactly. Right. I tried. I tried that game. I keep meaning and, to try it, but I hear how the co-op works, and it just turns me off right away. Yep. yep. You got Restless Hero on PC and Xbox One September sixth. Six. It's a little two D platformer, right? Yeah, it looks very minimalist yeah. in in graphical style, but uh, I mean, I don't know. Even the jumping just looked looked very like even pre old school, if that makes sense. Sure, I, it's got a neat name, but beyond that, yeah, it doesn't excite me. Mm-hmm. Then we got Creature in the Well, Switch, PC, and Xbox One coming on September sixth. This game looks neat. It's a little pinball game, yeah, Scott. It's a, a pinball hack and slash, yeah. so to speak. Um, I'll be talking about that one next week for sure, so stay yeah, tuned for that's that. That's going to action. We got Gun Gun Pixies coming on PC and Switch September 6th. I love that you left this one on the list because I watched this trailer and I have absolutely no idea what this game yeah, is. Yeah, I learned nothing about it. It's just a silly name and it looks like a, a Japanese game with some potential horniness involved. So I just wanted to, yeah. I just wanted PlayStation to know, boy, if you had put this game in your system, you might have sold some copies, but there's that Switch raking in the horny gamer money, you fools. <laughs> You're not wrong. Not uh, wrong at all. NBA 2K20 is a huge release on PC, PS4, Switch, Xbox One, September 6th. Going to make a lot of money. Going to sell millions of units. I couldn't care less. 
I'm with you, but I am shocked by how many people that I talk to just in public that just adore the 2K games. There is, they're just yeah, living in Chicago, that I didn't feel like there was any bigger franchise than 2K. I yeah, gotta get home and play 2K, man. Nuts. I gotta get home and play 2K. And you do 2K refer to NBA. Correct. Because yeah. there's no there's no 2K NFL games anymore, unfortunately. Do they not do any other sports? Well, I guess they gave up baseball because they just simply weren't as good as the show. Forgot about that. Right. Well, no, they, they still do the um, – the baseball ones, oh, God, what's not M- MLB the show? Obviously, is the is the PS4 one, right. but there is. I don't think they do the Major League Baseball 2Ks anymore. Not 2K, but there is another series. Okay. There's the, RBI the, the, baseball, the, I think. RBI baseball. Oh, that's yeah, that's, that's like a cartoony one, right? Um, a little bit, yeah. yeah. And then there was there there was another one that uh, has two versions of it. That's actually a pretty quality baseball game. It's actually pretty in depth in terms of mechanics. Huh. But uh, but they use those small squatty characters, but it's it's a legitimately pretty good game. So that's cool. Yeah. If you like baseball, for sure. Yeah. Uh, still, the show is way better, but that's besides the point. So Zach, you have been playing Astral Chain, the game that I probably won't play because I just I am terrible at this type of game. But I I just had to watch like twenty seconds of this trailer to know that this is a game that you were going to play, and I was right. You picked it up. And played it. So talk to me about this. This is Platinum, correct? Yes, this is Platinum. This is their uh, first game since Near Automata, which I can use, which okay. I can talk about because it's relevant. And yeah, it's. Uh, I've, I've only. I will preface. I've only played like three or four hours of it, uh, just because I, mm-hmm. I started it and then I was like, I gotta do the side missions of control. <clears throat> um, but it's it's pretty neat. It's uh, not quite the Platinum game you're used to, though. For instance, there really isn't a big combo system in this game at all. It is, okay, you, that you, actually helps me a little bit. I was going to say, yeah, it might be more up your alley. In fact, the the primary attack button is the right trigger. Really? Yeah, it's just like a, it's like a simple melee combo. Because what you're mostly doing is you have a little demon attached to your, your arm via an astral chain. Uh, okay. They're called legions. And that's kind of doing a lot of the fighting for you. So you can, you can summon it out during combat, and then you can... You can reel it back with a yank of the chain, and eventually you can start. You can move the legion around with the right analog stick, which is not as confusing as it sounds. By the way, is it? It okay. works. Yeah. It works. It does sound confusing. Yes. Uh, no. You hold down the left trigger, and then you enter like movement mode for the guy, and you can just move him to where you want to go. And it's pretty neat. It's just a simpler combat system. You can do cool stuff with the chain, like you can wrap it around characters to kind of bind them for some easy attacks. Or oh, if okay. an enemy is charging at you, you can like hold, you and the legion can hold the chain taut to trip them up, which is pretty neat. So, it so, so they, it sounds interesting. Yeah, you get a lot of mileage out of the chain thing. It's just it's a different kind of game, you know, having these this creature fat, battle for you as you kind of fight on the sidelines almost. And it's really neat, and I mean, I like it what I'm playing so far. It's almost like a you know, I guess a Pokemon more than it is a platinum. Yeah, game. I mean. It, it sounds like if Pokemon were God of War, because like when I hear when I hear melee weapons with chains, I think I think the Blades of Chaos is. Yeah, your your primary attack is a, a stun baton, and you can also use a pistol. And I'm sure there's more to unlock later on, but honestly, it is just a, yeah, it's like a three four hit combo chain that just repeats off the right trigger. So it's not this in depth action you might expect out of Platinum Games, but it is different. And it is interesting. So there's some dodging and rolling you got to do then as well too because that sounds very simplistic. Yeah, I mean you can you can dodge out of the way and that'll slow down time a la every other platinum game ever and let you do some follow-up attacks. But it really is it's more about, you know, keeping control of the crowd of enemies and knowing where you're knowing who your legion's fighting, knowing who you're trying to fight and you know dodging where you can and not taking a lot of damage. Uh but but there's a lot more to the game than just the combat actually. It's almost like an RPG-ish thing. You're you're walking around these levels and you're because you're a you're a cop in Neo Tokyo, right? And you're investigating, <laughs> like you can investigate different crimes. Like I tailed a guy because uh, I was trying to overhear his phone call, uh-huh. and then I sent my legion out and he listened in on the phone call for me because not regular humans can't see the legion. Basically, your demons, oh. the cops can, so you can send him out and he can kind of relay the information to you. So how does he relay the information to you? Does he speak English or you speak your language? I think it, it's like it tra- psychically travels down the chain. Let's say they don't really go into it. Oh, okay. it's just neat. You you find out about a drug deal going down in a warehouse and you arrest him and stuff. 
and it's just uh, there's a lot of that, a lot more exploration, a lot of exploration in the game. Uh, probably too much story to be honest, which I know is a crazy thing for me to say, but it's I feel like there's been a lot of cutscenes up front. But I don't know, it's it's a really cool world. This you know feature kind of dystopic Neo Tokyo where you have these demons bound to your cop soul. It's it's pretty neat. I just I gotta get further into it. I'll have more to say next week for sure. But uh, it's it's definitely got its hooks in me. How Japanese is it? Because oh, I heard very there's Japanese. like a character that that's a bear or something like that. Yeah, you, I uh, you know I took my my girl character and went to the bathroom, and then there was a fairy in the stall next to me who needed toilet paper to uh, bless the toilets of the of the police station bathrooms. Okay, so it's pretty Japanese, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, I was. <laughs> oh, you know what? I will say there's one thing that just nigg- like there's this niggling aspect of the game that just irritates the hell out of me. There, so your character is silent, right? Mm-hmm. But you play as either you can choose to be male or female, and you're one of e- either twin. Oh, okay. Right? But your character is silent. But whenever you go into dialogue, your sibling is with you the whole game so far, and they'll interact and ask questions like, "Hey, what's going on? Where do we need to go?" Like your your sibling says this. So you know the character you didn't pick has all these lines of dialogue for every scene. So if I like I'm playing as a girl character, my brother's doing all the talking. If I played it as a boy, he would just be dead quiet and the the sister would be doing all the talking. So your character is silent for no reason. And on top of that, you know there is dialogue for your character written and spoken that you just don't have because I guess they think they're in like putting you in the role better, but it just sticks out like this wild sore thumb. That bugs you a lot. There was another game that we talked about recently that 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 did that. Well, si- wasn't it uh, Metro? Yes, yeah. Silent protagonists bug me in general, but it's even worse when I know the character I didn't pick has all the lines of dialogue for all the cutscenes in all the game. So I know you have the. I know you went to the trouble of recording dialogue for the character I'm playing as, but you just don't use it. That makes sense. That's, and it seems kind of weird just to just use the dialogue. It's truly bizarre. Because yeah, it's. Yeah. It's really weird, but hey, they have a lot of character customization. That's really cool. I get to dress up my character all the time. She got like a little purple hair with a side buzz. It's pretty sweet. Nice. So, do you recommend it? Based on what I played, I would recommend it. Yeah, if you got a Switch, you know it's another Nintendo exclusive, and honestly, Platinum hasn't put out a game in like two and a half years, which is a long time for them. Mm-hmm. So, I would say yeah, and it's it you know it's something different, you know. Even for them, it's not their standard combat. It's just it's something more unique. Well, I'm glad you uh, are giving it good marks because people that haven't played it are review bombing it because it's not on their platform of choice, which yeah, it just drives me crazy. They're children, I tell you. Yeah, I I just doesn't don't get it. Yeah. But Let's... Again, that is Astral Chain, which is exclusive to the Nintendo Switch. Right. If that sounds interesting to you, be sure to check that one out. But well, you've been playing the Dark Pictures anthology, Man of Medan. On yes, I Xbox have. One. I actually uh, started it today, so I, ha- I haven't finished it. I know the game is supposed to be pretty short, but I put a pretty good dent in it uh, enough to uh, to talk about it for sure. Um, did you play? You played uh, Until Dawn, yes? Yeah, it kind of took the world by storm. It was hard to ignore. Yeah, it was a game that uh, w- was a lot of fun. This one is very similar in its tone and in its art style. It's It's using real actors that have been digitally... Uh, recreated in a game. Did I spot and, Sean uh, Ashmore? You sure did. Yeah. And I didn't know that until I started playing it and saw his name in the credits. Yeah, you think and they would like, have advertised Whoa. that you know, a little bit bigger. That's what I thought as well. I was like, I didn't even know he was in the game until I actually <laughs> played it. So that's that's insane to me. But uh, I, I really like the setup for this game. The story is starts with a prologue that takes place back in World War II on this uh, World War II battleship. And you you have a couple characters that you play as that are, uh, you know, they're they're soldiers that uh, one got thrown in the brig and and the other one got thrown in the infirmary for being drunk and disorderly. And um, they wake up and just everything on the ship has gone to hell. And uh, I won't say anything more for risk of spoilers, but uh, as these kind of stories do, they fast forward to the future. And uh, you're with a, I'll say a team of five people in their early 20s that are out on a boat in the middle of an ocean doing some diving, looking for a wrecked airplane. As you do. And, uh, well, yeah, they're explorers, but uh, it's 
uh, th- things happen, and eventually you wind up on this World War II ship that is just floating in the middle of the ocean for uh, an unknown reason to me at this point in, the, in how far into the game I am. So that's the, the setup, and it's got a very supernatural vibe to it. Uh, that at least it's hinting at that, but it's also hinting that maybe what I'm thinking is happening isn't happening and it could actually be something else. So I feel like I have an idea in my head of where the story is going. Um, I just, I, I, it's like they, it's like they haven't decided which one to give me yet, if that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it it sounds very until done. It is, but I got to tell you, man, I am not enjoying it as much as until dawn. Uh, I, I, I mean, to the game's credit, it is gorgeous. It's it's it looks even better than Until Dawn did, especially the moody atmosphere that this one's got on this uh, like derelict World War II battleship is just it's really cool. Um, but man, I am just I feel like I'm just walking around, just trying to find the path to go. Uh, there there are little collectibles to pick up that uh, that give it some hints as to what's going on in the story. But is that not what but... Until Dawn was? Just walking around but I felt, until you get to the next cutscene, f- basically. Yeah, but I felt more engaged with that for some reason until dawn. Do you think it's and because of the longer format? You had time to kind of learn the characters better? Maybe. I mean, the the intro to learn, you know, the character development, actually, I appreciate it. And this is a game where, I know this sounds crazy, with as big of a fan of video games as I am, I really just want to sit and watch this story in a movie format. Hmm. I I, I I know that's sacrilegious to say on a on a video game podcast, but actually there is like a, a couple different modes to play this game. Uh, one of them is like a theater mode, so you can kind of watch it and, and still have minimalist choices to make. But there's a there's a two player mode of this game where you can kind of pass the controller back and forth and each play a different character because you obviously you, you go in between the different characters as you go through the game. So when one character is up that this person is assigned to, you just give the controller that. So I've heard people have made this into a party game where everybody gets assigned one character and they make all the decisions for that person and how they interact with the other characters and uh, and, and whether or not they succeed or fail with the, the QTEs that are obviously present in this game, which I've not played it that way, but that sounds like an interesting, fun way to play it. Yeah, I mean, it's making the most of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's the oh? Is it better or worse than Hidden Agenda? I really liked Hidden Agenda, okay. so I don't. That, that's probably not a, a, a good question to ask. I haven't played it. I just keep meaning to because Katie Cassidy's in it, but I keep forgetting. I mean, if you're gonna play Hidden Agenda, get at least four or five people, because and actually, I would recommend having an odd number of people because there's a voting system in that one that uh, y- you want that deciding vote to keep from it ever being a tie. If that makes yeah. sense. Um, but I really liked Hidden Agenda. I am enjoying this game for its story, and I'm curious as to see where it's going. And the creepy atmosphere is 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 really good. It's it's more jump scares than legitimate horror. But uh, I'm I'm invested in the story, and I got to see it through. Um, I un- I may have killed off one of my characters in the in one of the opening opening uh, areas well, before I even well got done. to the ship. But I'm not certain that this character's dead, and if you play the game, you probably know what I'm talking about because I, I can't decide if this is a a um, common thing or not because it was a single QTE that I missed. And I'm pretty good at QTEs, but this is one that I happen to be not paying 100% attention, and so I missed this super simple QTE. And uh, it, it uh, it's, it's one of those where you don't see the character die but they do like a, a a death animation kind of thing, but then they allude to the character where the, where the other characters don't know if he's dead or alive, so he's probably alive, if that makes sense. I gotcha. I mean, you could find out uh, the shorter length, maybe. The, the fact that it's shorter makes me feel like I might actually replay it to see how things play out differently. That's the thing, too, is like with other games like Until Dawn, where you make a decision and right away somebody lives or dies in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. In this one, with the distance that I've put in this game, I really don't have any idea what impact my decisions are making on the game itself and, and the path that I'm, that I'm getting. Maybe they're so because, invisible that they're, you know, the, the, that, the, they're so well done that you don't notice them. 
Well, there is in the sub menu, they've got different character traits for each character. So you actually pause the game or go to these traits by pressing the RB button, or in your case, the R1 button. And uh, it pulls up like each character's personalities, traits, and how far up they are. So kind of think of like, you know, like Knights of the Old Republic, where you've got the morality meter that's either going to be Jedi or, or uh, Sith. So you've got that, but for different types of emotional responses. So I got an achievement today for for maxing out one of my characters' aggressive character trait meter. I, and I don't know. I didn't mean to. I, I, did, I tend to play these kind of games where I have choices to make as the way that I would as a character. But in this case, they kind of give you almost like a mini dossier at the beginning of the game when you're introduced to the character that talks about what kind of personality they have, whether they're reckless or whether they're demure. Uh, you know, they, they, they kind of break it down. So I'm finding that I'm actually playing these characters instead of playing them as I play myself, I'm playing them as the way that the character was introduced to me, which is which is interesting. Oh, yeah, so. that's definitely a little bit different. Mm-hmm. So uh, you seem a little but, wavering on a recommendation. Yeah, it's, it's not... It, 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 it's worth checking out... Especially because this is a budget title, it's only thirty bucks at at release, and and I, I'm enjoying the story. It looks great. I just I just want to do a little bit more than walking around. It's not. I mean, I'm not complaining that there's no combat. I just want to do a little a little bit more, especially because the characters move so slow, and the camera angles are 100% fixed. You you can't control the camera angle at all. So sometimes you can't see the depth correctly to see if I'm going through a doorway or should I be looking over here? Can I skip this area? I just want to get to the next story beat because I'm that into the story. So it's a little bit of a slog that way, but if you are familiar with that formula, it's, it's worth it for the story. Okay. And that is the dark pictures anthology man of Medan. I'm playing it on Xbox one, but it is also available on PS4 and I believe PC as well. Does that sound right? Yes. Definitely. All right. <laughs> it definitely does. All right, we got some other games to uh, talk about that we've been catching up on. Before we do, though, I want to say thank you to four more sponsors very quickly. First off, Lori Janko Wilkie. She is an agent for State Farm Insurance. She is a person that can help you protect those video game collections that you've got if you're a collector like me. Plus, she can cover all kinds of other things for you as well. You can reach her office at area code 815-223-2118 if you're in the Rockford area. She's actually in Peru, Illinois. Also, Blue Box Cafe down in Elgin. This is a Doctor Who-themed cafe with delicious sandwiches and coffee, and I'm telling you that from experience. I've been there, and Chris puts on a mean cup of coffee over there, and they've got great food as well. You can find them at 175 East Chicago Street in Elgin or on their website, theblueboxcafe.com. Two more quick ones, Holsebus Chiropractic over at 1010 Harlem Road in Machesney Park, Illinois. Their address is machesney.holsebus.com chiropractic.com if you want to help get uh, get your back fixed or just general health and wellness. A lot of people think that chiropractors are just for your back, but they are actually all about holistic health. And I've had actually got a lot of help from uh, Ryan Hulsebus over there. And last one, Classic Limousine. This company is actually providing transportation for our three celebrity guests for R2V2, and they are sponsoring the show. You can check out them for all of your transportation needs at rockfordlimo.com. As for games that we've been catching up on, I've just got one quick one to mention, Zach, because at Open World Gaming, I played a lot of Rocket League, which uh, which sounds weird for me because I don't play a lot of online games, but I was at this place that's a, that's a land site. I felt like I, I needed to help out with this closed beta testing to actually test some of the online capabilities of this. Mm-hmm. So that, that 3v3 game I played was Rocket League. And they've got this new mode in that that I had not... It's been so long since I played Rocket League. Have you played Rocket League? Yeah, yeah, I've played a lot of Rocket League. Okay. Have you played the new the new mode, like uh, Drop... I can't remember what it's called. It's called Drop Something. I mean, I haven't, I haven't played it in a couple of years, but, man, I used to you know, rush home after work just to put in a few rounds of Rocket League. Oh, yeah, me too. It wasn't a successful but night the... until I got an MVP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this new mode basically has no goals. It's it's not the you know like a soccer goals or whatever. It, if you've seen the movie Tron, you know like those 
the the discs game where they throw the ball up and it, and if it hits the ground below you, that piece of the ground disappears. Yep. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh-huh. So imagine just like a completely round room that's made of hexagons, and if the ball is lit your team's or the opposing team's color and it bounces on your side of the arena, that piece of the floor disappears. Now, the cars won't fall through the floors, but the ball will. And if the ball goes through the floor, that is a goal. And that was a brand new mode to me. And it was kind of interesting, but it made me want to, I, I still prefer just the regular three on three because that's way, way better. I did find I was able to start learning to fly a little bit better. You know how you oh, do the really? jump yeah. and boost mm-hmm. in the air? That's an expert level technique. I'm nowhere near some of those crazy mechanics that those guys on YouTube do, but uh, I actually am able to control my direction a little bit, so that was that was fun. But that game just doesn't stop being fun, especially when you're a group of people that you all know. So, Are you going to start joining Chad's streams? I, well, I can't now uh, because I can't. He plays at wee hours of the morning, that are way past my bedtime, and I got to get up at four in the morning now that school is starting tomorrow. So I, I will not be able to join with him at those hours. But uh, maybe I'll talk him into coming out to Open World Gaming with us. We can play some there. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, as for me, I uh, decided to start going for the platinum and control. Oh really? Yeah, I was already so close that I figured, why not? And I'm starting to do all the side missions. Which yeah. I touched on. I, you know, I played a bunch of the side missions in my main playthrough, and a lot of a lot of good ones, a lot of excellent pieces of lore. But man, I'm doing some more, and definitely don't sleep on the side missions of this game. There are whole boss fights. There's this whole like recurring boss fight that's happening throughout the game that's only happening in side missions, and that's wow. that's really cool. It's kind of like this thing that's hunting you. You kind of learn more about the board. If you started that game, you'll know what that means. And there's like a there's a whole mold infestation that barely gets touched on in the main game, but there are, there are side missions that deal with it more directly. It's just it's really it's really good. And also, hey, the shooting in that game is still amazing. I can't wait to play that one. I've I've got it, but I had to finish up a game for review, and I had to finish a I, I want to finish up Man of Medan for certain. And then Gears comes this weekend, and I just feel like that's yeah, going to consume my time. That's definitely going to cut into some actual chain. Gears Five. Yeah, so I don't know what's gonna what's gonna happen, but uh, I I've got it in my on my Xbox as we speak, and I, I I promise you I will get to that game before the end of the year and those talks come up, man. How about that? Sounds good. Yeah, it'll be important. All right. Well, that is gonna do it for this episode of the Gaming Outsider. Zach, any parting words or recommendations for the listeners? Not yet. Nope. Sorry. Go read. Go read the Green Lantern comic from Grant Morrison. It's real good. But not the one from the other guy. Yeah, yeah, not who I saw on the show now. All right, well, thanks so much, everybody, for listening. Please be sure to email us if you have any questions or concerns. Our address is feedback at thegamingoutsider.com. Until next week, I'm Scott Clark with Zach Parkerson, and we are The Gaming Outsider. And remember, there's no such thing as a bad game, just games that aren't for you.